Uh, Bill, super excited to be here with you. Uh, we started talking a while back, and obviously we're big believers in this lake house concept. And we started working with you uh, uh, around this, and you started writing about this and evolving your thinking. You were cranking up material around this data lake house. You've seen this industry over many decades, and you've seen it evolve and go through different transitions. I'd love for you to walk us through uh, the sort of evolution from, you know, started with data warehouses to data lakes to the lake house. And you've also generously shared with us some images from your upcoming book. Uh, so maybe we can look at those and you can walk us through uh, this evolution. Uh, in the beginning were applications and people started building applications. Uh, uh, and then they discovered that uh, they had data everywhere. And, and it wasn't a matter of, can I find data because data was everywhere that so became a question of can I find the right data and and that's when people discovered that uh, they needed integrity of data and that's where the data warehouse was came in uh, the data warehouse the discipline required to build the data warehouse and to vet the data was the impetus for building the data warehouse and answering the question what is the right data uh, without having to go throughout the organization uh, uh, and then data warehouse came along uh, after Data Warehouse came along, we uh, discovered uh, uh, data marks, uh, uh, and then we discovered uh, quite a few other things uh, along the line. Uh, uh, and, then, and then the world began to discover other forms of data. Uh, we began to, 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 to look at uh, uh, analog data. Uh, we began to look at uh, textual data, and we found out that there is a, a, a wealth of information uh, that hasn't ever been looked at before. I think it's kind of interesting to, to note that uh, if all you look at is classical structured transaction-based data, you're probably only looking at five to 10% of the data in the corporation. And then there's nothing wrong with that because you need that data, but, but, but uh, you're not looking at the full picture of, of, uh, of what's going on in the corporation. And every now and then I'll pick up a book on of data management and data architecture and all the person talks about is structured data. And I thought, you know, this is, this, this is, this is not right uh, uh, because they're only looking at a, a fraction of what is in the corporation. In order to look at what's in the corporation, you've got to look at structured, textual, other unstructured. Other unstructured would include IOT data, uh, would include uh, analog data, uh, 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 would include a wide variety of data. That's the picture of the real data in the corporation. And so that's what we're, we're faced with today. Now, in truth, uh, the world is facing an avalanche of, of data coming from all over. And, and, and the challenge is, uh, number one, organizing the data so that you can understand what's there, number one. Uh, number two, uh, merging the data together so that you can uh, uh, find out information that goes across more than one of these environments. Uh, that's a second challenge. Uh, no, number three, organizing the stuff so that you can find anything because there's so much data that's out there uh, trying to uh, uh, organize uh, uh, the information to where it can be found is a challenge. And so uh, if you take the data and just put it into a data lake, uh, th th that's a good first step. But it's only the first step that uh, uh, after you've created the data lake, uh, you've then got to say, okay, uh, I need to have another layer of uh, analytical information uh, uh, for it because uh, uh, such things as lineage of data. I mean, again, it's, it's kind of interesting to know what a value of data is, but until you can understand where did that data come from? Uh, when did it come into the system? Uh, what's been done to it? Uh, what hasn't been done to it? Uh, all of those informations are uh, relevant to uh, 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 understanding uh, how to do analytical processing, uh, analytical processing in an effective fashion. So uh, if, if I were to look at this diagram that's in front of us now and say, where is the industry? Uh, the industry is at the point of having building and or going to build a data lake. And then the next step is them discovering that 
uh, they need an analytical infrastructure uh, uh, in order to make that data lake uh, comprehensible and usable. And this is where machine learning would come in uh, uh, and a lot of other things. So that's, a, uh, uh, that's where I think we are today. And so here we see that analytical infrastructure that needs to be uh, added to the data lake uh, uh, in order to uh, turn it into usable data. Uh, this unlocks the data for the end user so that it not only can the data scientists use the data, but the end user can use the data as well. And once we do that, we've opened up the door to uh, um, uh, lots of other analytical tools. We certainly machine learning, certainly data science and, and statistical processing, uh, but all kinds of other people can now start to go in and find and use the data. And this is, you know, uh, uh, these are your images from your book and, you know, uh, your images, they go from top to bottom. Uh, so, so up at the top is where the data comes in, I believe. Yep. And, and yep. at the bottom is where you're actually, the use cases where you're getting value out of that data. That's correct. That's fascinating. Many of us are fans of your book, Building the Data Warehouse. You know, mm -hmm. and we actually taught it. We've been, we were taught it and then we've been teaching it at universities and we're big fans. Uh, you know, is there, you know, are, are we gonna see more, more books from you? Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, I, I've done uh, in my life 60 books now. Uh, the 61st book is one on uh, the data lake house, uh, which I'm working on right now. Uh, uh, and in many ways, the data lake house uh, has a lot of, not all of, but a lot of the propositions that was facing data warehouse uh, 25 or 30 years ago. So I'm working now on the definition of what is a data lake house and how do you go about building it and what are some of the characteristics? Yeah, and in the lake house, that's, is that a first class citizen, the data science? Uh, it's kind of interesting. It's my observation, and I could be wrong about this, but it's my observation that when the first notions of the data lake house came, came about, uh, that uh, it was primarily for the data scientist. Uh, but but, but uh, there is another whole community of, of plain old end users that need to look at that data as well. So uh, um, in, in order to accommodate, and it's really kind of interesting, the, the data scientist looks at one kind of data and the end user looks at another kind of data. It's the same data, but it's looked at in different ways. And uh, so I, I think in terms of the maturity of the data lake house, uh, we need to start to accommodate the end user. I think the data scientist, uh, I think the data lake house was originally built with the data scientist in mind. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, and then now expanding it to also include the traditional BI workloads and end users who might want to see simpler dashboards or you have places where they can actually understand the data more, uh, you know, in a, in a simpler way. Is that Absolutely. That's true. And, uh, and, and, and actually the, uh, uh, the data scientist and the end user are, are probably looking for different things. I mean, they might be looking for the same thing, but in general, uh, the data scientist is looking for patterns, uh, trends, uh, and things that haven't been seen before. And the, uh, the end user is typically looking for things like KPIs, key, key performance indicators, uh, and things like that. So they're, they're, they're essentially using the same data, but they're looking at very different things in that data. That's fascinating. Uh, and last you know, decade or so, you've been working on textual ETL yourself. That's correct. Uh, we've been taking the technology of, of uh, the problem of looking at uh, text and asking itself, ourselves the question, how do we turn this text into actionable uh, information? Because there's, a, there's actually a tremendous amount of business value that's buried in text that isn't being looked at today. And these are text records that might not even have a lot of structure to them, right? It's not, this is not tabular text that you get that's adheres to a particular schema when it comes in. If you're waiting to have structure in text, you're gonna be waiting a long time. 99% uh, of the text that's out there in the world has no structure. I mean, it, it's like our conversation. There's nobody sitting there telling you what to say. There's nobody telling me what to say. We're just having the conversation. And so uh, in terms of structure, 
Uh, I don't know. We're certainly friendly with each other, but there's not really any structure to, to what we're talking about, nor is there for emails, for uh, what's on the internet. I mean, text and structure, structure just really, as far as I can tell, doesn't exist in text, or at least if it does, it's not very much. How do you do no. that with your textual ETL? How do you understand the context? I can tell you, having been doing this the last 10 years of my life, that managing text is 10% of the battle and managing and understanding context is 90% of the battle. Uh, uh, it really is difficult. Um, um, we, <laughs> different text has different requirements. Some text can be handled one way, other text can be handled a completely different fashion. And so uh, the last time I looked in our technology, uh, we have uh, about 67 different algorithms in our technology. And, and our technology goes in and selects the appropriate algorithm for the given piece of text at a time. And uh, you said you have 67 algorithms or so that well, understand the context. Uh, how are these built? Are they, there must be a lot of variety. Uh, let me give you a flavor of just some of the algorithms. Uh, one of them is called something called homographic resolution. And suppose uh, uh, you were a doctor and reading doctor's notes, and you saw the term HA. Now, what does the term HA mean? Well, if a cardiologist wrote HA, it would mean heart attack. If a general practitioner wrote HA, it would mean headache. If an endocrinologist had written HA, it would mean hepatitis A. So the interpretation of what HA means depends entirely on who wrote it. And, and, that's, and that's one of our 67 uh, um, algorithms that we have orchestrating uh, how do we determine context. Got it. So you're really using these advanced statistical techniques and these sort of to understand the context from these 60 or so algorithms. and they sort of, you know, search over the data multiple passes, and is that is that done on a sort of lake house pattern? Uh, well, uh, what we do is is we we read the raw text and then put it into a form that goes into the lake house. Once it's in the lake house, it can then be analyzed and mixed and merged with with other kinds of data. On um, speaking of languages. Uh, when you, the processing that your textual ETL does in the lake house, um, does it, do you have a variety of also programming languages that you're actually using to access them or what's this written in actually? I'm curious, your technology. The underlying, uh, the underlying technology that we have is Microsoft VB.net. So Bill, I'm curious uh, on your take of ELT versus ETL. Certainly. Um, uh... That, that, that's actually a naughty question because uh, uh, there are advantages and disadvantages to however you do it. I've always been a fan of ETL because of the fact that ETL forces you to transform uh, data before you put it into a form where you can work with it. But some organizations want to simply take the data, put it into a database, then do the transformation. Now, when it comes to text, text is a different uh, beast altogether, because uh, I, I'm, I'm not a believer that you can do ELT with text. I mean, I mean, I, I, I tell you what, if you can do it, I don't know how. And, and we do this every day. And so uh, I, I think for text, you, you don't have any choice but to do ETL. Uh, other technologies, you do have a choice. And there are some reasons for doing ELT. And I understand those, but uh, uh, but um, uh, again, I'm a fan of ETL because ETL forces the organization to do the transformation. And I've seen too many cases where the organization says, oh, we'll just put the data in and transform it later. And guess what? Six months later, that data has never been touched. The way we see it is when, when there's more structure to your data, you can do ELT because you can load it in and you can use SQL. Yeah. With SQL, you can do a lot of the transformations actually once yep. it's loaded in. Uh, but as you pointed out, for all these complex data types, the text and the audio and video and all these other, the data science workloads, uh, it's just very hard to express that with SQL. Yeah, with, with, with images, for example, I, I don't believe you can do ELT with images. I mean, maybe you can, maybe you can, but I don't know how it's done. Yeah. 
uh, well, a lot of these machine learning frameworks that actually analyze the images, they directly access the, the files and do ETL. Yep, yep, yep. The, 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 yeah, the, that makes sense to me. So, um, so switching gears, um, end user is really important. Uh, there was this concept of data lakes for a long while. Yep. Persisted. Would you say the data lakes did a good job of addressing those end users? No. Uh, uh, the data lake, uh, um, the data lake was not thought out from an architectural standpoint. Uh, from a technical standpoint, I think the data lake, I mean, that was fine, nothing wrong with it. But architecturally, the, 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 there were many things missing from the data lake. And, uh, 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 and, 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 and because they were missing, uh, it made the data lake not useless, but it made it very difficult to, to get information out of. I mean, you've worked in this space a long time. Would you say many data lakes turn into data swamps? <laughs> most of them do. Every now and then you see one that doesn't, but, but most of them do. And the lake house, how, how does it, so it takes that data lake, but now also adapts it to end users, helps you with the structure that you need uh, so that you can actually make sense out of that data, not just turn it into data swamp. That's correct. Uh, what, what, I can say, yes, that, that is correct. That with, if you take your data lake and turn it into a lake house, you can actually now start to get your money's worth out of it. If you don't turn it into a lake house, it, it, it turns into a swamp. How, how important is uh, open source, open aspects of these architectures today? I mean, that didn't exist when you came up with the concept of data warehousing, you know, many, many decades ago. But today, oh. there, yeah. Uh, you know, many, many decades ago, uh, Oracle and IBM and Microsoft uh, uh, had secrets. I mean, they, 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 they tried to keep everybody from openness. And, uh, uh, and, and uh, I, I, I think the world that we live in today, uh, is, first off, is a different world. And I think it's, it's a positive thing that it's different. And uh, I'm, I, I, the, the data warehouse would have accelerated way back when had we had openness back in that day and age. And I'm glad that we have it in this today. Yeah. So is it a good summary to say the lake house gets the data science focus from the data lakes, but it also gets the application and the BI uh, focus from the warehouse and blends them for all these variety of data sets that you referred to earlier. Is that a yes. good summary? I would, I would absolutely agree with that statement. Um, that's awesome. Um, I'm going to get a little bit personal here. Um, so when we uh, started talking, uh, you started writing these blog series about the lake house. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it seems, it seems you're writing them in the middle of the night. Uh, tell us a little bit what's going on. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm a writer. Uh, I've written 60 books right now. And, and to me, writing is a form of relaxation. Uh, for most people, writing is hard work. Uh, but at this point in my life, uh, I would rather sit down and write a good book than I would uh, uh, go out and play a game of golf. And, and so uh, writing to me is a form of relaxation. Uh, uh, it's, and I enjoy it. I mean, what, I mean it's, an in, it, it's like doing a crossword puzzle. It's an intellectual challenge. I enjoy doing it. And, and there's nothing that I would rather do than sit down and write a good book. And, and, uh, and I mean, God has made different people different ways. And, and God made me a writer. And so uh, I, I write uh, very quickly. Uh, if I were, you know, some, some artists, uh, the painters uh, take a long time to make a painting and some painters paint very quickly. Well, I would be uh, one of those painters that painted very quickly. Um, and, you know, we've been big fans of the Lake House, but you've helped us actually evolve that through your writing, you know, and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and we couldn't keep up with your writing because, you know, there's, you keep cranking in the mouth at very fast pace, but you know, we, we at Databricks we would have whole groups of people sit there and read these and try to and say, "Well, actually, we haven't thought about that." Um, wait till you see the book, uh, uh, which, by the way, is now on chapter eight. Uh, so uh, uh, I should have, I hope to have the book finished by next week. But uh, wait till you see the book. There's there's a lot of information that I think that the Databricks and the world is going to find useful. The Lake House, um, when you said when you wrote the book, Building the Data Warehouse, you wanted everybody to go off and build their data warehouse. 
Yep. Uh, so you're now writing a book on the lake house. Right. Uh, is the intention that you want people to run off and build lake houses? Uh, absolutely. I, 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 I'll tell you what, uh, it's almost a different proposition. What if people don't go and build data lake houses? Uh, they're going to end up with this, this flood, this, this avalanche uh, of data that they're not going to know what to do with. And, 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 it, and, and that's going to be tragic because you can do so many things with the data. So uh, it's not so much a problem of are they going to build a data warehouse? It's going to be what happens if they don't build a, 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 a lake house. And, and because if they don't build a lake house, they're going to have this mountain of data that sits there and nobody's going to be able to do anything with it. In the long run, what do you think the impact of the lake house will be? And if you put it in perspective with the, the previous sort of industrial kind of impact that data warehouse has had. Well, I believe the, the, the lake house is going to unlock uh, the data that is there and going to present opportunities like we've never seen before. And, 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 and that's going to be the effect of creating the, uh, the, the, the lake house.